Welcome to virtual algebra class. Today we're going to be talking about a very important concept and that is slope from the equation of a line. I don't know why mathematicians do this, but we always save the best one for last. Uh, but this is actually the easiest way to find slope if you can remember it. The hard part is always remembering it. So um, let's just uh, ask a little bit of a remember just to make sure that you remember the prior knowledge that you need to know in order to do this. So, so far we've talked about finding slope in uh, three different contexts, okay? And so the big concept we have to remember is that finding slope um, requires uh, different methods depending on what you've been given, what kind of information you're starting with. And uh, I um, never used to teach slope this much uh, before 2014 with the new version of the test came out. Because before maybe you'd have one or two questions about graphing your slope, but now the GED loves slope problems and it loves comparison problems where you're going to have to look at slope in a bunch of different scenarios all from within the same problem, which means you really have to be adept at asking where, where am I starting with this? So I'll just remind you that the first thing we did was we found slope on a graph. And when we did that, we just counted our rise and we put that over our run. Uh, the second thing we did was we found slope uh, when given two points. And how did we do that? We used the slope formula. I should take out the word two points because sometimes they gave us even more than two points. But at least when they gave us points, we use the slope formula. And then the third thing we looked at was we found slope uh, from a word problem or a scenario. And we said that you should look for the rate of change, how fast something was changing. A really good clue that it was a rate of change was that it was this kind of wording that said something per something. Okay, so hopefully those three things are familiar to you. Uh, Merle, did you get a chance to, I know you were in most of these classes. Mm -hmm. Does this all sound familiar to you? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Then you won't struggle too much today. So today we are going to talk about finding slope when what we've been given is the equation of a line. They didn't give us a picture. They didn't give us a word problem. They didn't give us points. This time they give us an equation. And as like I said, as it turns out, that's the easiest one, okay? So I'm gonna do a couple little example problems so that you'll be able to uh, figure this out for yourself. It's kind of nice. You'll see the pattern. So um, we are actually going to do a couple of review problems in order to see the pattern. I'm not just doing this for no reason. I really need you to see something from this. So the very last class we did, we actually stopped talking about slope for a minute and we started talking about graphing lines, graphing lines. Um, and so this is why, because I needed to talk about graphing lines before I could talk about the last kind of slope. So let's just make sure we remember one last thing. And let's see if we remember how to graph the line y equals 3x plus 2. Oh, actually, I think I'll do 3x minus 2. 3x minus 2. Okay, so we I said last class that there's m many ways to graph lines, uh, but we've only learned one so far. Do you remember our tool that we've learned to graph lines? The graph... Um... Uh, I like your, your tracing it there, you know, sorry. the T table, the T yeah. table, exactly. We'll pull out an X, Y table. And we said we could just pick some X values um, and we would probably pick, pick small numbers and then we would use them to find some Y's. So why don't you just go ahead and choose some X values for me? One. Sure. I like one. Zero. Zero is a great one. And two. 
and two, and you remember then that I said two points makes a line, but three points makes sure my line is straight. So wonderful. Let's think about what would happen here if we plugged one into this equation. If we took this equation and we plugged one in for x, what would y end up being? Well, let's crunch the numbers and find out. What's three times one? Of course, it's three, and from that we'll subtract two, and three minus two is just one. One. So when I plugged in a one for my x, I found out that my y was equal to one, and so I get the point one, one. That's one of the points on my graph, one, one. Great. I'm going to erase this right here. Are you good with this work? Yes. And I will do the work to find the next one. Again, a lot of students like to do this in their head. If you are an algebra ninja, you've been doing algebra a long time, I might let you do it in your head, but I have to tell you, I see more students make most silly mistakes because they do this in their head. So I like to write it down. So let's remember that if we have zero three times, I don't care how many times you have zero, you're still gonna have yeah. nothing. And from that, I'm gonna subtract two. And of course, since nothing does nothing, zero minus two is just negative two. So when I plugged in zero for X, I got negative two for Y. Does that make sense to you, Miss Morelli? Yes. Great. Now let's try the last one here. So I'll try plugging in. Again, I'm taking a look at my original equation. This time I'm turning my X into two. Plug that in and see what happens. Three times two is of course six. And if from that I subtract, two, I will get y, uh, y equal to four. So when I plugged in two, I got four. Okay, so here we have one, two, three points. Uh, all we need to make sure that we have a line and that it's straight. So let's go ahead and graph those on a graph. So I'm gonna bust out a graph. Let's see, my x values are all positive, my y values, okay. I'm just uh, trying to draw my graph in such a way that I have all the numbers I need and I don't go off the page. Okay, and I will count by ones. I will label at least once per axis so that people can be able to tell my labeling system. I'm just going by ones, but you know, there's no guarantee that you go by ones. I could go by fours or twelves or fives or halves. Whoops. One, two, three, four. and negative four. Okay, so there is my axes. I will slap down my three points and see if they do line up. So first the point one, one, there's my first point, the point one, one. So I come one in the horizontal direction, one in the vertical direction, and there's that sucker. Now my point zero, negative two. So I'm not going to go left or right because that's zero for horizontal, but I will go down to, I have a negative two in the vertical place. Uh, so that's the point zero, negative two, and now the point two, four. So I'll come over two on the horizontal and four on the vertical. Three, four. Uh, what do you think, Ms. Murley? Do those look like they're in a nice straight line? Yes. Okay, then we probably didn't screw up. Yay for us. Mm -hmm. Okay, now the reason why I wanted to do this was partially to refresh your memory, but partially I need you to notice two things. I need you to notice two things about this graph. What I want to look at is where is the y-intercept and what is the slope? So it's been a while since we've talked about y-intercept. Do you remember what a y-intercept is, Marley? I actually don't. Okay. Well, the word intercept means to cross. To cross. So the y-intercept is where our line crosses the y-axis. Whoops. So here's my y-axis, and here's my line, and you can see where they cross. They cross right there. So that is the y-intercept. Are you cool with that? Yes. Now, mathematicians are super duper lazy. You know, we do not like to spell words. We often give you letters uh, to mean um, a whole word, right? And so students expect the letter for us to use for y-intercept would be y. But we already use the letter y to mean the y-coordinate. So we're not gonna use y. Instead, they use the letter b. 
And that can be really irritating to students because there's no B in the word Y intercept. Mm -hmm. and I actually don't know why they do that, but we call that the B, the Y intercept. We use B to stand for Y intercept. Is that cool? Yeah. So I can see here that my crossing point, my B is at negative two. Can you see that? I crossed right where Y was negative two. Make sense? Yes. Okay, cool. The other thing that I want to, so I said Y intercept was where my, I'm just going to write this down in case anyone's taking notes. I have this vain hope that people actually take notes off these YouTube videos, but they probably don't, Marilee, but they should if they want to learn. <laughs> so it's where my line crosses the Y axis. Okay, awesome. Okay, so first thing. Now, the other thing that I want to point out to you, okay, is the slope, the slope, those two things we can see from our graph. So we see the y-intercept, that's our crossing point, but we can also see the slope. Do you remember how to find slope on a graph? Um, I forgot, sorry. <laughs> No, don't feel bad. There's a lot of information in graphing, and even though none of it's hard, there's just a ton of it, and that's why review is really, really good. So we just said on the front on the first page here, uh, when we first started this class, that slope from a graph is done by counting the rise over the run. Does, do you remember that? Does that make sense? Uh, yes. Okay, great. So I'm going to start at any point on my graph. So shall we start right here? And I'm going to count my rise. I'm going to go from this point to that point. That's my goal. Okay. I'm traveling. I'm moving and I want to figure out how uh, quickly my line moves or how far it goes up. Quickly it goes up. So I can see that I have to rise here. One, two, three units. That's a rise of Three. Does that make sense to you? Yes. yes, it does. And then I have a run. How much do I have to run here? One. Exactly. And so I have a rise over run. That's a slope. And you remember we learned to use the letter M for slope. Oh, yes, I remember. Mm -hmm. A rise over run of three over one. Does that part make sense to you? Yes, it does. Right. And then we learned for our final answer, we would make sure that our fraction was simplified. And I know that three div divides perfectly by one. One goes into three, three times. And so the slope of this line is three. Does that make sense? Yes. Now, Marilly, I want you to look at these two numbers we just found. We just found out that the slope is three. And we just found out that the y-intercept is one uh, was negative two. Oh, I'm sorry, negative two. Yeah, so two different things. Okay, now go back and look at my equation of a line that I was graphing. Do you see those two numbers that we just talked about right there? Yes, I do. Yes, where do you see the slope? <clears throat> I'm sorry. Which one was the slope? The three. The three, and you can see that slope there shoved up against that X. Can you see that? Yes. And then our, we said our Y intercept was? Negative two. Negative two. And you see that negative two off by itself, uh, not multiplying with X, but adding or subtracting. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Okay. I want to show you that this uh, pattern um, continues. Um, so let's do one more just like this. Are you good with this page? Is this good? Yes. <clears throat> and I am going, I used to go really quickly through this lesson because it's super easy to teach. But one thing I began to realize is that even though students would uh, catch on to it very quickly, they would also forget it very quickly. Mm -hmm. That's one of the um, worst things about math. It's actually the easiest things that we forget uh, because we never had to struggle with them. We never had to process them. We never had to do much to figure them out. So if your teacher just tells you this is like this and it's super easy, you'll probably forget it. 
So it's a really good idea to get to see why something is true. It'll make it less likely that you forget it. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, so we're gonna do the same thing with graphing the line y equals negative one half x minus two. We're gonna do it with the one way we know how right now. Later we'll learn more ways. Our next two classes will be on that. But for now, we are gonna use our xy table. So Ms. Marilli, notice here that I am asking you once again to uh, graph a line, but do you notice how this time the x is being multiplied by a fraction? Oh, yes, I do. Do you remember how to pick y's values when you have a fraction involved? Three. Ah, uh, three is not a number that I would like to half. It, it's, there's nothing wrong with it. You really could do it, but if you did it, three broken in half, you would get a fraction or a decimal answer. Does that make sense? Yes, yeah, so it would be two. Two would be a better, exact, whoa, what am I doing wrong? Hold on one second mm -hmm. while I stop screwing up. Exactly. You're exactly right. Two would be a much more pleasant number to take half of. I wouldn't mind mm -hmm. that at all. Um, any other number you could think to take half of? Four. Oh, I think, can I actually change something up here? Yeah. Zero, two. Yeah, four and zero are both great. I'm actually going to do negative one half x plus one just so it won't have the same thing as last time. Okay, and you want to do four and zero? Okay. So we picked three x values, two, four, and zero, and you guys are all going to pretend like I never changed that uh, equation up there, like it always said y equals negative one half x plus one. So let's plug in these x values one at a time and see what they do to our y. Okay, so first I will plug in the two. Whoa. I meant to change x into 2, and I didn't. So I substitute my x for a 2. And now, this math looks harder than it is, as I tell students all the time, because you might not know much about multiplying fractions, but I bet you know what half of 2 is. What's half of 2, Marley? I'm sorry. So, yes, 1 half of 2 is definitely 1. I'll drop that negative sign, because I haven't done anything to cancel it out, and I'll drop the plus 1. Now, if I have negative 1, and to that I add 1, of course, those two are opposites, and so they're going to zero out. Are you good with that? Yes. Okay, so when I put in a 2 for my x, I got a 0 for my y. I'm going to erase this work, just so I have room for my graph, and I'm going to do the next one. Okay, now let's see what happens if we plug in a 4 for x. Okay, so let's do the same thing again. Um, I'll deal with the negative uh, by dropping it later, but what's half of four? Two. It, she's like, I got this now. <laughs> Good job, Marley. Okay, so yeah, half of four would just be two. Drop my negative, because I've done nothing to cancel it out, and I have my plus one. So negative two plus one, I'm two dollars in debt, but then I add a dollar to my account. My balance is gonna come up by a dollar to negative one. Are we good with that? Yeah. Wonderful. So when I put in four, I got negative one. Okay. Next one. I almost think I should make a mistake one of these days, but I haven't done it yet. Mm -hmm. So that you can see what I mean by three points, make sure your line isn't straight. But <laughs> Okay, so Oh, y equals negative one half times zero. Okay, so now this is the case. I don't care what you're multiplying by zero. If I have nothing of any number, I'm just going to end up with zero. nothing. Does that make sense? Yeah. And to that, if I add one, of course, I'm just going to get one. So in this case, when x was zero, y ended up equaling one. And so I have my three points to slap on my graph. Are you good with those three points? Yes. Okay, great. So let's get a graph going. And if you remember your coordinate plane consists of an X and a Y axis. I need to have at least one label on here so I know what you're going by. Looks like my numbers are pretty small, so I can go by ones again. So I'll call that one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. 
I don't have enough room there. Negative one, negative two. Okay, so I'll graph the point two zero. So that says come over two horizontally and don't go up or down. Check. I'll graph the point four negative one. So I'll come over four horizontally and then go down one. Check. And now I'll graph the point zero one. So I'm not going to go horizontal, but I am going to go vertical by one. Okay, so those three are nice and straight in a nice straight line. So I'm pretty sure I probably did my math right. I will connect them. And there's the graph of my line. Uh, so hopefully we remember that concept. That's good. But once again, I want to look at two things. I want to look at the slope and the y-intercept. So let's pull out our color we were using for the y-intercept. We were using blue. Ms. Marilee, do you remember what letter I said we would use to stand for our y-intercept? Uh, B. Absolutely, B. My y-intercept is where my graph, my graph crosses the y-axis. Can you see the point where my graph crosses the y-axis? Uh, it's the first one. Yeah, you see, exactly. It's right there. So what number are we at on the y-axis there? So if this is zero, right? Imagine counting up. This must be... Um, one. One, exactly. So my y-intercept here is one, okay? Because it has a y value of one. Now, some people would write that as coordinate points, Marilee. They, you, they could tell you it's a zero on the x and a w one in the y. But the important part of the y-intercept is that one. Are you cool with that? Yes. Okay. Okay, wonderful. So, um, I got that. Now, let's talk about our slope. So, we said that our slope... We would represent with what letter? Do you remember? Um, M. M. Beautiful. And we said we would find our slope by counting our rise and over our run. our run. Now, on this graph, I don't care what point you start with and what point you end with. It does not matter, okay? okay. Uh, but I do like to go from left to right when I count slope just because I make less mistakes with negatives, and so do you when you guys go from left to right. So first, I see that I'm not actually rising on this graph. I'm actually falling. Can you see that? Yes. So I actually went down one. So I have a negative one rise. Make sense? Yes. Cool. And then how much am I running here, Miss Marilee? Two. Exactly. Two. So my rise, and I should put it in quotation marks because that's really a fall, is negative one. And my run is two. And if you were to put that in your GED calculator, negative 1 over 2, you would find uh, that nothing would happen. It would simplify to be negative 1 over 2 because that fraction is reduced. It's as simple as it's going to get. Are we cool with that? Yes. Okay. So right here, I see that I have a y-intercept of 1 and a slope of negative 1 half. Let's go ahead and look at our equation again. Do you see those numbers appearing again? Yes, they do. Yes, absolutely they do. Once again, we see this slope shoved up against x, and we see that the y-intercept is the number out here adding or subtracting, in this case, positive 1. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Okay, cool. So uh, we can derive a rule from this, and then once we have the rule, we don't have to do all this graphing anymore. Yay for not having to go the long way. <laughs> Okay, but the, like I said, you forget short, easy rules if you don't know where they came from. So here's where it comes from. So uh, let's go take a look here. I'm going to stop this share. And I'm going to come back to my whiteboard. And we will now have a number four for our list. So... We know how to find slope when we're given a graph. We know how to find slope when we're given points. We know how to find slope from a word problem. Today, we are going to add to our repertoire. How do we find slope from an equation? Okay. Turns out there's an if in this problem, and we'll talk a little bit about it. But if and only if the equation is in slope intercept form mm -hmm. we can see 
the slope. Okay, and we saw that slope again and again. It was always the one that shoved up against X because slope is a rate of change. Slope is how fast your X is changing. Slope will be multiplying with X. Okay, so the slope is multiplying with X. We call that the, the coefficient. A number multiplying uh, with a letter is called a coefficient. So the coefficient of x. OK, um, two things I got to show you. I got to show you the formula sheet. I just want to show you that you don't have to memorize something. So see how I said this language? If the equation is in slope intercept form, I use this wording is in slope intercept form. You might be going, what the heck is slope intercept form? The great news is that um, you actually don't have to have this word memorized because this is something on the GED formula sheet. So let's go ahead and look at the GED formula sheet. So at the top of the GED formula sheet, we have our geometry formulas, area, perimeter, surface area. Those are the things to do with geometry, shapes, measurement. But if you come down to the bottom of the sheet, we have the algebra formulas. Okay. And you can see the very first one we've already used. We used the, the slope formula. There's that one. But look at the next one. It says slope intercept form of the equation of a line. Slope intercept form of the equation of a line. And there it is so that you don't have to have it memorized. Y equals MX plus B. If you have your formula sheet printed out, and I highly suggest you print it out, I would mark this up right now because this is what you need to know. Mathematicians are like not always the most creative people on earth, okay? So when we named this form of a line here, we were not creative about it. We called it the slope intercept form of the equation for a reason. And that's because it shows us two things. Look at the letters there, y equals mx plus b. We know what m stands for. You've been telling me over and over again, Miss Murley, what m stands for. What does m stand for? For um, slope. Exactly. And so we can see what this thing is telling me. It's telling me whatever number is multiplying with x is going to be the slope. And then we also see that it's adding with b. And we said b stands for the intercept. Exactly, the y-intercept. So why do we call this thing the slope-intercept form? Because it shows us two things. It shows us the slope and the intercept. But notice that this only works if it's in this form. The big check that it's for this form is if the y is alone. Do you see how y is alone on its side of the equation? Yes. Yes. So you know that something is in the slope-intercept form of the equation of a line when it's solved for y, when y is alone. Now, Ms. Marilli, I finally did get married. That's good news. But I was a single math teacher for a very, very long time. So I used to have a joke about the slope-intercept form to help me remember uh, it. And this is a good thing for you to know, because even though you don't have to have it memorized for the GED, you will have to have this memorized for your college math classes, okay? So this is the little thing I used to always say. I used to say, why am I always alone? Because you're always going to see the why alone on its side of the equation. Does that make sense? Yes. And then I would say, even my X is married. So see that little M shoved up against the X? I would joke that this, that's Mrs. X, and she's such a slope. Anyway, even my X is married. And so you see the X married to the slope. The M is like Mrs. X. Does that make sense? Yes. And then I would say, with a baby. Why am I always alone? Even my ex is married with a baby. That little B is your Y-intercept, the baby. And so that's how we would remember this form when I had to have it memorized. Okay. But now I'm married and my husband doesn't think it's a very funny joke. <laughs> Especially since he's an eighth grade math teacher. Okay. Oh. <laughs> Oops. Anyway. So that's how I remember it. But the great news is what you really need to get from this is if y is alone, you can see your slope. You can see your y-intercept. You don't have to do any work. 
And that's a beautiful thing. The mathematician loves to be lazy. Okay, so let's stop this. Let's pull up our whiteboard here and add that to our notes. I do not know why things keep disappearing off this screen. Okay, so we said the slope intercept form of a line has y alone, always, always, always. Why am I always alone? Even my x is married, so you see that slope shoved up against the x with a baby. The y intercept is always adding or subtracting. Um, and oh, once you know that, you can just, the rest of the problems are going to be so easy. They're going to take me longer to write than they're going to take you to solve, like seriously. <laughs> <laughs> so let's try some GED examples. <laughs> so what is the slope of the line y equals negative 3x plus 4? Okay, just looking at this, um, I can see that this is in slope intercept form. How do I know? Well, do you see my y alone? Yes. Y is alone, so yay. That means this is super, super easy. I can see the slope. The slope is always the one that's shoved up against x. Mm -hmm. So what is the slope of the line y equals negative 3x plus 4? Well, I'm too lazy to spell slope, okay? So I'm going to be the lazy, lazy math teacher who just uses the letter for slope. I'll say, oh, the slope is equal to... Again, I'm too lazy to spell is. The slope is negative 3. That's the number shoved up against x. Notice I just write the number down, the coefficient. I don't write x. And that's it. I answered in a complete mathematical sentence. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. That's it. That's really how simple it gets. And since my computer is really, really screwing up on me, um, I'm going to do the rest of the examples on my trusty little tablet, which is much more reliable. So GED example two. I could ask you, what is the, now remember that sometimes instead of saying slope, we say rate of change, but don't stress if I change the wording on you, it's the same thing. What is the rate of change of the line? Y equals two thirds X plus seven. First thing I'll ask, because remember this only works is if, if I'm in slope intercept form, is am I in slope intercept form? The way to tell is if your Y is alone. So Marilly, is your Y alone? Yes. Then yes, I'm in slope intercept form. Make sense? Yes, it does. Okay, so check, I'm in slope intercept form. That means I can see the slope and I can see the Y intercept. Well, they asked me about rate of change. So rate of change is another word for slope. So they're asking me about slope. So what's the slope of this line? The slope is two and three. Two thirds, exactly. And that's it. That's the, I'm done. There's like no math to do. You just straight up just have to know that. Wow. Um, and that's why I said it's easy to do, but it's also easy to forget when things are easy like this. Does that make sense to you, Miss Murley? It does. Okay, so next one we'll do. What is the slope of the line? I want to show you some GED tricks. That's the only reason I wanted to do any more examples since this is so stinking easy. But here's one way they might try to trick you. What is the slope of the line 4 minus 2x? Now, it's an interesting question if I ask you, is this in slope-intercept form? Because the answer is like, kind of. It's kind of in slope-intercept form. I mean, the y is alone. Technically, it's solved for a y. But it's not written in the usual order. Um, can you see that I mixed up the mx and the b? Yes. Yeah, usually my x thing is at the beginning and then my plain old numbers at the end. I mixed it up here, but don't let that mess with you. Remember we said that m is whatever number is multiplying with x. So what number is multiplying with x here? Two. Negative two, exactly. Mm -hmm. See how that that is? I know it's a minus two x, but when you think of it as a multiplier, it's a negative two um, multiplying x. Does that make sense? Yes. And so my slope here is negative two. So if there's a sign in front of it, it belongs to the number it's in front of. Make sense? Yes. Cool. One trick.
Okay, here's another way they can try to trick you. It can look like there's not enough information. What is the slope of the line y equals 2x? So this one looks a little weird because it looks like we're missing information here because there doesn't seem to be anything adding or subtracting. In fact, I think I'll move this uh, question mark over here so I can play with it. Okay, but I still say this is a pretty easy thing because I can still see the number that's multiplying with x. We know that the slope, the m, is always the number that's shoved up against x and we can see that number. So Marily, what's the slope here? The slope is 2. Brilliant. So don't panic. Students panic and lose their minds all the time because the problem got too easy. This is a really simple problem. Of course the slope is 2. Okay, I had a couple more um, GED examples I wanted to try to squeeze in here. So um, let's call this one example 4a. <laughs> since I have a five coming up. Okay, um, what if they told you uh, to find the slope and it looked like there was no coefficient? So let's see, this is a really typical GED example and I realized I forgot it. So let's make sure we look at this. So find the slope of y equals uh, x minus 4. And once again, you can see that we have that y alone, okay? This is solved for y like we wanted. So it's definitely in that y equals mx plus b um, form, but yet students go, oh, there's no number right here in front of x. And so they tell me m must be equal to 0. That's a slope of 0. And if you thought that you wouldn't be alone. <laughs> a lot of students think that, but you sure would be wrong. That's not true. Okay, there's not zero x's there. If there were no x's, we wouldn't write an x. There's an x sitting right there in front of you. The coefficient we use to number when we have more than one x, or if we have a partial x, or but when we just have a single solitary x sitting there by itself, we figure the whole world can count to one. How many x's do you see? Um, I see. 1x. So the in, invisible coefficient, as I sometimes call it, the number that's out front when you don't appear to see a number is 1. And that doesn't mean x is equal to 1. A lot of students think that, oh, x is always 1. My teacher told me, no, no, no. X is a mystery. He might be 7. He might be 14. But whatever he is, there's only one of him. If there's no number out front, there's only one of that number. It only is happening one time. And that's what I mean by that. Okay, so find the slope um, of y equals 1x minus 4. Well, now it's easy to see that that slope is really 1. Okay, and that can appear in more than one form. It can also happen if there was a negative. So same thing, if they gave you like, find the slope of y equals negative x plus 3, same deal there. It might look like there's no number out front, but be careful that's not an m is equal to zero or m is equal to negative zero. If you don't see a number, a coefficient out front, it's like there's an invisible one. So it's like this is negative one x. Okay, and so the slope here would be negative one. Great, hope that makes sense. Example five. Uh, what is the slope of the line? Now, I have to tell you the truth, I actually have this problem memorized. I know when it looks like this what its slope is going to be. Um, and we've talked about that in another class. But if you don't have it memorized, like a lot of students don't have all this crap memorized because they're not mathematicians and they don't do it every day. So if you don't have it memorized, no big deal. We can still use our um, slope intercept form in order to see the equation of this line. Okay, so let's remember, and I'm going to just write it down, that if I were to look at that GED formula sheet, slope intercept form is y equals mx plus b. So I know that the number that is multiplying with x is the slope. And the number that's adding or subtracting, it's off by itself, is the y-intercept. <clears throat> Take a look at this uh, 
number here. It just says y equals 2, okay? Do we see any x's? Do you see any x's in this problem? Yeah, in this, in this one over here. y equals 2. Is there uh, no, x's in there? No. No, there's no x's in there. I'm going to say that again. There are no x's in there. Okay, so we have a number that means nothing. Like I have none, I have nothing, I have zero. Does that make sense? Yes. So if I wanna say I have nothing of something, that's like I have zero of it. So it's like here that I have zero X's and this is um, up above, I had a two um, and this is a clearly a positive two. So it's like I have zero X's plus two. Now, of course, mathematicians never ever brag when we have zero of something. So they didn't write it in the equation, but that's what's going on here. Since you see no X's, it's like you have a slope of zero. There are zero X's in that equation. And so your slope is zero. And that, uh, like I said, is one of those easy, easy problems that students forget a lot. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, so if you see no x's in your equation, no x's, x is just what we usually use for the independent variable. Um, I suppose it could be a different letter, but if you have no independent variable in the equation of a line, you have a slope of zero. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so that's what I have here. For example five, I would have a slope of zero. So example five was almost like example four, right? But mm -hmm. in four, the two was shoved up against an x. So here the slope was two. This really was a slope because it was multiplying with an x. But here this two is not multiplying by an x. And so there are no x's and so I have a slope of zero. Make sense? Yes. Okay, cool. Big, big difference there. Okay, almost done. Two more. Let's take a look at example six. I want to just show you how they can try to screw, another way they can try to screw with your head. So they could change the wording a little bit, which throws students. What is the rate of change of this function? And we've seen we know that functions are just relations. Um, so there's no guarantee necessarily that a function is a line. I mean, yeah, a lot of lines are functions. But this one I know is a line um, by looking at the function because I can see that even though it looks a little different, um, it is definitely in y equals mx plus b form. Okay, so I'll show you how I know that. First of all, this notation over here on the left of this equation, it says f of x. Ms. Merley, have we talked about that f of x before? Not that I remember. Okay, this is known as function notation. It's saying, all this says is that I have a function, I have some kind of a function, some kind of a, an equation really, um, where x is the independent variable. We read this as f of x. Students look at this and they think, oh crap, it's new math to do. I have to multiply an f times an x. This is not math to do. Function notation, this f of x is just a really formal way to talk about y. f of x is just the formal name for y. Kind of like I could call you uh, Marilly and be informal, like calling you, calling the function y, or I could be formal and I could call you Mrs. D I don't know your last name and don't say it on air. That's okay. But I could call you Mrs. Smith or Mrs. Jones and I'd be being formal. Does that make sense? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So anytime you see f of x, you can just replace it with y. That is a y. Oh, okay. Yeah, exactly. And then I see negative 2.7x. Well, there's an mx and plus a b. So obviously, even though it looked a little funny, this is a line in slope intercept form. Make sense? Yes. So now that we know that, can you tell me what the slope is? The slope is um, 2.7. Negative 2.7. Brilliant. That uh, minus sign is in front, so uh, it belongs to that 2.7. So my slope is negative 2.7, and I don't write the x there because it's just the number. 
good, good, good. So it's unusual. It looks weird. We don't usually have decimals in these things, but whatever. It's still the slope because it's still multiplying with x. We good with that? Yes. Great. One last example and probably the fiercest one I got because it combines word problems with this concept. So let's look at example seven. I'd almost like to star this because I feel like this is, would be so GED typical. I wouldn't be the least bit surprised if you saw something like this, okay? A certain taxi company charges you a couple of fees. They charge a flag drop fee. Ms. Morelli, do you know what a flag drop fee is? No. That's a one-time fee that you pay the second you sit in the cab, you got to pay that money. Okay, so they charge a flag drop fee of $250 and A fee of three fifty per mile. The price you will pay to ride in their cab. can be modeled by the function and f of m is equal to 3.5 m plus 2.5. And, and then it says, what is the slope of the function? So students panic when faced with word problems. Pretty consistently they panic. If uh, I told you what kind of a word problem it was beforehand, you probably wouldn't panic so much. But they panic because they're like, what do I do? What kind of a problem is this? So always know what you're looking for and what you've been given. So I can see what I'm looking for in the question down here. They say, what is the slope of the function? So they're telling me to find slope. Now, we had said that the way you find slope is going to differ. It's going to differ depending on if you have a graph or you have points or you have a word problem or you have an equation of a line. And you might say to yourself, Kate, I have a word problem. But I would say to you, Marilee, you also have the equation of a line. Okay, so they gave it to you in two forms here. So I don't care which way you think it's easier, word problem way or slope of a line or, you know, equation of a line way. It's here in both ways, okay? So let's, since we're talking today about doing it from the equation of a line, let's go ahead and take a look at these equation of a line. So first thing that freaks students out is that this function does not use x. Instead, this is a function of yeah. <laughs> But it still really doesn't matter. Whatever it's a function of, that's like the y value. So this is like you have y. And it might say it's equal to 3.5m instead of saying 3.5x, but it's still my independent variable that's in there. It's just as if this m had been an x. Uh, they're probably using m because they're talking about miles. Does that make sense? But it doesn't matter what letter we use for the independent variable. That guy inside is like the x. It's the independent variable, and whatever's multiplying with it is going to be the slope. Does that make sense? Yes. And so I can see right here that my slope is 3.5. And I think I'll use the word slope instead of the letter m since I used m in another way in this equation. So my slope is 3.5. Okay. Are you cool with that? Yes. I could have also seen that in the word problem because remember we learned two weeks ago that the in the word problem the slope is the rate of change and it's usually measured in something per something. And you can see it up in here in the wording. I have a fee of 350 per 
mile. It's a something per something. It's how quickly my cost is rising. It's a rate of change. And so $3.50 is the same as 3.5. Either way, um, my costs are rising 350 or $3.50 per mile I travel. So that's still a slope of 3.5. The answer could be in either one of these forms, but hopefully it makes sense. How does that look to you? Good. Is that okay? Yes. Brilliant. This is as tough as these problems get, really. Wow. Um, the only way that I could make your life harder is by comparing um, lots of different um, slopes in one problem. And I think I will start my next class by doing that for a good refresher.